One of Putin's life goals is the re-establishment of the Soviet Union. He calls the breakup of the communist regime the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. Since taking power in 2000, he's worked hard to make this dream a reality. Even before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, Putin made himself busy getting involved in conflicts across Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. With the war going so badly in Ukraine, it's likely Putin will have to seek a quote-unquote easy victory somewhere else to restore the image of the Russian military after the war concludes. But where might the next invasions take place? The first one on this list is Georgia. It's the most likely candidate for a Russian invasion since it already happened once before. Back in August 2008, the Russian army invaded the breakaway regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Both of those regions are comprised of ethnic minorities within Georgia who have possessed a strong desire to become independent. But why was Russia involved in the conflict? To understand why, we have to delve into the history of those two breakaway republics. When the Kingdom of Georgia began conquering lands hundreds of years ago, it brought numerous ethnic minorities into the fold. Among them were the Abkhazian and South Ossetian peoples. After being absorbed into the Russian Empire, the Communist Red Army conquered the area during the Russian Civil War. Now officially part of the USSR, these two areas became their own independent republics that merged with Georgia once more. After being declared autonomous Soviet republics within Georgia, this became the status quo until the dissolution of the USSR. When the USSR broke up, the two republics had a strong minority within them that wanted independence from Georgia. However, because they had been a part of Georgia for centuries, the international community recognized these areas as part of Georgia. This resulted in the governments of the two breakaway states declaring independence, kicking off a bloody civil war. However, during the war, the separatist forces received a ton of military assistance from Russia to carry out their wars of independence against Georgian forces. With no international help, Georgia lost both conflicts, and the two republics now had their own quasi-independent status. Over the next 16 years, the two republics had an uneasy truce with Georgia. Throughout this time, numerous clashes broke out between the two breakaway republics and the Georgian forces. Often these clashes consisted of cross-border artillery fire, sniper attacks, and ambushes of Georgian patrols. Despite the fighting, no major flare-ups occurred until August 2008. During this time, the South Ossetian forces began heavily shelling Georgian positions in violation of the 1992 ceasefire agreement. Georgian forces responded in kind, and when the South Ossetians kept on firing, Georgia troops launched a limited incursion into South Ossetia to silence the artillery fire. Within a matter of hours, the Georgian forces controlled the main separatist stronghold in the region, but it was too late. Unknown to Georgia, Russia had already been secretly funneling troops into South Ossetia in the previous several days. These troops had been waiting on the border since at least May of 2008, when Russian troops began mysteriously building up on the border for no apparent reason. After Georgia took the bait, it was all the excuse Russia needed to launch a full-scale invasion of the country. Within days, nearly 100,000 Russian troops alongside tens of thousands of Russian armed separatists quickly overwhelmed Georgian forces. In less than a week, the Russian military not only retook control of all separatist lands, but advanced further into territory not claimed by either separatist group to create a so-called buffer zone for the two regions. Fearing further land grabs against their country, Georgia sued for peace to limit the amount of territory Russia could seize. Russia took over approximately 20% of Georgia's territory during the five-day campaign. To this day, Russia maintains a 10,000-strong occupying force within the region, with about 5,000 troops split between either breakaway republic. On top of this, Russia continues to violate the peace agreement signed at the end of the war that allows third-party monitoring of the conflict zones. Because of this, Russia could likely move more troops and equipment into those regions with no oversight to finish what they started in 2008. For the Georgian people, this possibility is a real threat to their existence, and ever since the full-scale invasion, fear has been widespread of Russia continuing the 2008 war. Depending on how the war goes in Ukraine, Putin might decide to invade Georgia once more for the quote-unquote easy victory that he promised to people, and to restore some prestige to the Russian military that's been so far humiliated on the battlefield in Ukraine. The next country Russia is likely to invade on this list is similarly partially occupied by Russia, but it's one you've probably never heard of. Sandwiched between Romania and Ukraine's southwestern border is the small Eastern European country of Moldova. But while it is its own independent country today, most of its existence it was not. What is Moldova today used to be part of Romania. However, a year before the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, the USSR was busy occupying territories in Eastern Europe while Stalin and Hitler were still buddy-buddy with one another. 
after the Russian invasion of Poland in 1939 and the occupation of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia in 1940, Stalin set his sights on another country, Romania. Without getting too much into the weeds, there used to be part of Romania known as Bessarabia and Bukovina. These two regions in the country's far northeast were home to primarily ethnic Moldovans, who share many ties with the Romanian people. Stalin wanted this territory and invaded Romania in June 1940 to claim it for the USSR. Within the first year of the Russians' occupation, 12% of the population was either deported or murdered. While temporarily reoccupied by Romania during the war, the Soviet Union reclaimed the area in 1944 and remained part of the USSR until 1991. During this time, numerous Soviet republics, including Moldova, had their own independence movements. Moldova didn't recognize the Molotov-Ribbentrop Treaty that supposedly gave Stalin the legal go-ahead to invade Romania. They declared independence in 1991 and soon made several highly contentious changes, including changing the official language to Moldovan and strengthening ties with Romania. During the transition to independence, problems started to arise within Transnistria, a region of the country bordering Ukraine. Due to Stalin's murder and deportation campaigns in the region, as well as the ethnic Russians and Ukrainians moving in after being incentivized by the USSR during the Russification effort, Transnistria was and remains predominantly made up of Russian-speaking immigrants. But with Moldova now free of the Soviet yoke, these ethnic minorities in the region became afraid that their political voice would soon get washed away in the pro-Moldovan fervor sweeping the nation. Their worst fear was that Moldova would rejoin Romania, and this was something that they wanted to avoid at all costs. Thankfully, Russia felt the same way. Inside this part of Moldova was a large concentration of Soviet troops under the 14th Army. These troops were still loyal to the USSR, and when Transnistrian militia units asked for weapons and ammunition, the Soviet forces readily opened up their armories to them. In addition, large numbers of 14th Army troops numbering around 14,000 joined the rebels and thousands of volunteers from Russia during the breakaway region's fight for independence. The Moldovans were outmatched. They did not have a military or any arms when they declared independence. They quickly had to train an army and get weapons from Romania to fight the separatists. However, with the gains won by the separatists in the early months of the war, it was a losing battle for Moldova. They eventually saw the writing on the wall and settled for peace with the breakaway republic. As part of the 1992 peace agreement, the Transnistrians agreed to a demilitarized zone and maintained a Russian occupation force of no more than 2,400 troops in the country. Since 1992, the Moldovans and the Transnistrians have lived an uneasy truce, with Moldova frequently complaining about the Russian troops in its country. However, unlike Georgia, the ceasefire violations have not been nearly as dramatic or violent, though several flare-ups have occurred, with the most serious of those happening in 2022. In April 2022, the Transnistrian government claimed that a terrorist cell attacked the state police headquarters in its capital of Tiraspol by shooting at it with an RPG. Local militia forces claimed to have recovered an empty launcher, and there was damage to the building, but no arrests were made. Over the next several months, there were at least seven more attacks or failed attacks, including drones dropping explosives on the Tiraspol airport, a Transnistrian ammunition depot coming under drone attack, and a Transnistrian military convoy coming under a drone attack, where it dropped anti-tank grenades on them. None of these attacks caused any casualties, but they did cause material damage in some instances. Both Moldova and the US concluded that these false flag attacks were likely performed by Russian security forces to drag Transnistria into the war with Ukraine. However, Transnistria did not take the bait, since its current political leadership does not agree with all of Putin's long-term goals. Of course, that's not stopped Russia from trying. According to a secret FSB document, Russia has a 10-year plan to take over Moldova. The short-term strategies include support for pro-Russian political candidates and limiting energy supplies to Moldova. In the long term, the document talks about using more violent and overt actions, such as using false flag attacks, to justify a Russian military response. This is not as far-fetched as it seems, especially when it comes to Putin and his tactics. During the current war in Ukraine, several prominent Russian generals and politicians have made statements that Moldova is suppressing the Russian-speaking minorities in their country. Such statements are exactly the same things Russia did to justify its land invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022. So while an immediate land invasion by Russia seems unlikely due to its poor performance in Ukraine, the chances of it is not zero. Russia could invade Moldova on the heels of a negotiated peace settlement in Ukraine, using another round of false flag attacks, or as another quote-unquote easy victory, 
like Georgia to restore the public image of Russia's armed forces in the aftermath of the Ukraine debacle. The next country that Russia could invade might surprise you. Since the 2022 invasion, Belarus has been a staunch supporter of Russia. After all, its dictator Alexander Lukashenko allowed hundreds of thousands of Russian troops to pour across its borders to invade Ukraine from the north. Lukashenko has also allowed Russian troops to conduct attacks from Belarusian territory, allowed Russian units mauled in fighting in Ukraine to rest and refit, and tens of thousands of Russian casualties are treated in Belarusian hospitals to the detriment of local populations who cannot access medical care because of it. Yet even with all of this support, why would Russia take over Belarus? The short answer to this is because of its weak dictator. Lukashenko has been in power ever since Belarus became an independent country in the post-USSR breakup. However, within a few years, he sought closer ties to Russia. This ambition led to the 1990s agreement between Belarus and Russia, known as the Union State of Belarus and Russia. The stated purpose of this union is to increase the political, military, and economic relations between the two countries. In theory, the Union State imagined both countries using the same currency both countries recognizing each other's laws, established that both countries are willing to defend one another in times of war, and their citizens having citizenship in both countries. To date, very little of the Union state has been implemented. While Belarusian and Russian citizens are technically citizens of both countries who can work, live, and travel without any problems, most of this arrangement has rested on the military aspect. However, all of this changed during the 2020 Belarusian presidential elections. By all accounts, Lukashenko lost this election by a landslide. The frontrunner for the election, independent Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, won 80% of the popular vote. Of course, Lukashenko could not lose, and he later claimed that he had in fact won 80% of the vote. This decision nearly sent Belarus into a civil war, with massive protests breaking out across the country. Lukashenko had to ask Putin for support as his police and armed forces were stretched so thin they couldn't handle all of the protesters. In the aftermath of the 2020 election, Lukashenko has embraced his role as Putin's personal puppet. When Putin says jump, Lukashenko asks how high. The only thing Lukashenko did not do was to militarily join the war against Ukraine. He likely did this because he needed Belarus's small military, numbering only at around 50,000, to act as his personal bodyguard instead of getting annihilated in battle by Ukrainian forces. Several high-profile examples have shown Lukashenko's inability to act independently over the past year. When Wagner rebelled, he allegedly orchestrated the deal to allow Wagner to move to Belarus. However, within months, the vast majority of the fighters had been kicked out of Belarus at Putin's request and forcibly demobilized. Lukashenko also promised Yevgeny Prigozhin a safe haven in Belarus. He too soon left, and Putin assassinated him and his entourage several months later by placing an explosive under the wing of his private jet. These two examples highlight just how little influence Lukashenko has to act independently. If Putin wanted to fully implement a union state between Belarus and Russia, Lukashenko would be powerless to stop him from doing so. However, there is another scenario where Putin could absorb Belarus. In the aftermath of the 2020 election, Putin set up a special police response force specially trained to handle any situation in Belarus. If Lukashenko faces another threat to his power, like 2020, or when he dies, Russia will likely use this as an excuse to take over Belarus. Putin can then officially annex the country through the existing framework into the union state between Belarus and Russia. Although this next country is possibly the least likely to be invaded out of the ones we've mentioned so far, it is possible if a few conditions are met in this what-if scenario. Since being cut off from most of the world, Russia has continued to develop relations with its Central Asian neighbors. These five countries, once part of the Soviet Union, have historically had close ties to Russia for economic benefit and security guarantees since the breakup of the USSR, except for one country. Uzbekistan is the one Central Asian country that continues to defy Putin. The landlocked nation is the most populous country in the region and is the most aligned with the West. It also has the most stable economy in the region, and it does not need closer relations with Russia to keep it afloat. Additionally, Uzbekistan is the only Central Asian country to have left Russia's Collective Security Treaty Organization, or CSTO, its solution to NATO. Uzbekistan left the CSTO primarily because it disagreed over Russian policy in Afghanistan. Since leaving in 2012, Uzbekistan has continued cultivating its relationship with the West while slowly burning its bridge with Russia. This has angered Russian politicians, with some recently calling for Russia to annex Central Asian countries, including Uzbekistan. 
But what justification could Putin use to start another special military operation, this time in Central Asia? There are two main ways Russia could justify taking over Uzbekistan. The first of these has to do with the Uzbek government's position that it'll not deport Russians who flee there to escape the draft. Since the war started, some estimates say as few as a million and as many as four million Russians have fled the country. Hundreds of thousands of these men have ended up in Uzbekistan primarily because the Uzbeks refuse to deport any Russians who flee there unless they've committed a crime while in Uzbekistan. As such, Uzbekistan is a primary destination for those looking to avoid the draft permanently. With Uzbekistan now like Canada was to the US during the Vietnam War, this has angered many Russian politicians and military officers who despise the Uzbeks' defiance. Additionally, Uzbekistan really does not want its citizens fighting in Ukraine. Since Putin started drafting people, Central Asian men who live and work in Russia have been disproportionately targeted by draft officers. Uzbek men make up around half the immigrant population in Russia. These immigrants, as well as Uzbeks convicted of crimes and serving sentences in Russian prisons, are forced into military service at much higher rates than native-born Russians. While several Central Asian countries have said citizens fighting in Ukraine would be prosecuted, Uzbekistan has actually implemented laws to persecute Uzbeks who fight on Russia's side. While there are few documented cases, the first one came in 2022 when Uzbekistan requested information to extradite two Uzbek men who served with Wagner, whom Ukrainian forces had captured. But would these actions cause Russia to invade Uzbekistan? If so, what would that look like? While an invasion of Uzbekistan is unlikely, if Putin decided to annex Central Asian countries, he would likely aim to make Uzbekistan an example, to warn the rest of Central Asia not to question what he's doing. Putin would likely argue that Uzbekistan is violating Russian law by allowing hundreds of thousands of draft dodgers to live in the country. Their criminal prosecutions of Uzbek nationals for serving in the war could also be used as ammo to say that Uzbekistan discriminates against Russian citizens. This is because Russian soldiers who make it out in one piece in Ukraine are supposedly awarded Russian citizenship. As far as how that invasion would go down, using whatever trumped-up excuse Putin would need, he would likely use Kazakhstan as a staging ground. This wouldn't be an unprecedented move. Kazakhstan has asked for Russian troops in the past, like in January 2022. At that time, Kazakhstan was in open revolt against years of corruption and fraud that caused many Kazakhs to live in poverty, forcing the country's president to ask for a Russian military intervention just four weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia sent 2,500 troops to restore order, and Kazakh military and police units rounded up over 10,000 people while killing hundreds more. While it's a bit of a stretch, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say that if there was another flare-up in Kazakhstan again, Russia could invent evidence to say that Uzbekistan is destabilizing the country. Russia could then launch a ground invasion of Uzbekistan with the full permission of the Kazakh government. Now check out how war in Ukraine proves US military would dominate Russian military, or watch this video instead.